Welcome to Lesson 14a, Introduction to Drag and Automobile Drag. In this lesson, we'll define drag coefficient and lift coefficient and the appropriate area to use for each. We'll discuss power requirements related to automobile drag, and I'll define something called drag area. We'll look at the effect of streamlining on automobile drag, and I'll do an example problem. First, some definitions of drag coefficient and lift coefficient. Consider an object in a free stream of speed v, fd is the aerodynamic drag, and fl is the aerodynamic lift, where as sketched, the vector fd is parallel to v, and vector fl is perpendicular to v. These are not to scale in this diagram, because this body will have a very small lift compared to the drag. As previously discussed, we can define a drag coefficient and lift coefficient. The drag coefficient is c sub d, and it's equal to fd over 1 half rho v squared a. Lift coefficient c sub l is defined the same way except with fl instead of fd, where for either of these cases, a is an appropriate area. Typically, a is the projected frontal area, which is the area looking from upstream. Imagine looking at this object with a bright light behind it, the area that you see as a darkened area or shadow from upstream is the projected frontal area. This is the appropriate area used for cars, spheres, and most other non-lifting bodies. Alternately, we can define a planform area, which is the area looking from above. This is more appropriate for wings, which are lifting bodies, and flat plates aligned with the flow. This is necessary because if you have a wing, the frontal area is very small, but the planform area would be much larger. For an infinitesimally thin flat plate, the projected frontal area is zero, so we really have to use a planform area here. In these definitions of drag coefficient and lift coefficient, you can use whatever area you want, as long as you identify it so that someone else can use the appropriate area to calculate lift and drag force. Now let's look at the power requirement to overcome aerodynamic drag. We use capital W dot as power, rate of work power required to overcome aerodynamic drag on a body is simply the aerodynamic drag times the speed. Let's look at the dimensions. Power is defined as work per time, and work is force times distance, and distance per time is speed. So F arrow times V has the correct dimensions of power. For automobiles, the total drag force consists of two parts, a rolling resistance drag plus an aerodynamic drag where rolling resistance is the drag associated with a tire rolling along the highway. The rolling resistance is the coefficient of rolling resistance times the normal force, which is the weight, as you should remember from your physics class. And the aerodynamic drag is 1 half rho v squared times CDA. This rolling resistance term is a constant independent of speed, but this term varies greatly with speed. Using this equation for power, but applying it to the total drag, Rather than just the aerodynamic drag, we write W dot total is FD total times speed V equal mu rolling times W times V plus one half rho V cubed CDA. This first term is proportional to V, but the second term is proportional to V cubed. This W dot total is the engine power delivered to the wheels. The actual W dot produced by the engine would be even greater than this due to inefficiencies and losses such as in the transmission friction in the axle, etc. Let's sketch W dot versus V for an automobile. The power required for the rolling resistance is linear, whereas the power to overcome aerodynamic drag goes like V cubed. At low speeds, rolling resistance dominates. At high speeds, aerodynamic drag dominates. But at some speed, these two curves cross. The two curves typically cross at highway speeds, where rolling resistance and aerodynamic resistance are equal. I realize that some of you have a different idea of what highway speed is, but we're typically talking about 95 kilometers per hour, which is about 60 miles per hour, where these two curves cross. We can do a quick analysis. If we improve our drag coefficient by 20%, the improvement in your fuel economy is only about half of this, or 10%, at highway speed. The drag coefficient of automobiles has greatly improved over the years. The Ford Model T had a CD of about 0.8. The 2022 Toyota Prius has a drag coefficient of about 0.24. A Chevy Corvette 
has a CD of about 0.29. Automobiles with a boxy shape like pickup trucks have CDs in the range of about 0.4 to 0.5. And a typical sports car, CD is less than about 0.3, as we saw for these two cars. Now I want to define something called drag area. We write FD as 1 half rho V squared CDA. And we see this combination of drag coefficient and area that always occurs together. And it is this combination that determines the aerodynamic drag. CDA is called the drag area. So drag coefficient isn't everything. It's the product of CD and A that is important. If you have a small CD but a large area, you'll have a large drag. Similarly, if you have a large CD but a small area, you can still have a large drag. You achieve a small drag by having both a small CD and a small area. And we all know that small cars typically have better gas mileage than large cars. For this reason, CDA, the drag area, is often reported instead of CD for automobiles. I'll make a quick table of automobile type and drag area, which, by the way, has units of meter squared, since CD is non-dimensional and A is an area. Typical pickup truck is about 1.5. Typical van is about 1.0. Typical sedan is about 0.6 to 0.9. And a typical sports car has a drag area of about 0.4 to 0.7. For comparison, let's look at two nearly identical cars that have vastly different aerodynamics. Toyota used to make a Scion XA and a Scion XB. They had identical engines and transmissions, but very different body shapes. The XA was discontinued in 2006, and the XB was discontinued in 2015. Here are the EPA mileage estimates in miles per gallon, which I convert to kilometers per liter. The drag coefficient was 0.31, and the drag area was 7.0 square feet, or 0.65 square meters. The XB was much more boxy looking, so we're not surprised that its mileage numbers are worse. Again, I put these values in metric units. The XB had a CD of 0.35, and a drag area of 8.5 square feet, or 0.79 square meters. These are significantly larger than those of the XA. Here are some observations. The city mileage estimates do not vary much, since, as I said, aerodynamic drag is a small percentage of total drag at low speeds. But the highway mileages differ more significantly, where we compare this value to this value. Despite its boxy shape and its poorer fuel economy, Elderly people like the XB because of its easy access and roominess. We can do some quick calculations. The drag area for the XA improved by about 17.6% compared to the XB, so we predict that at highway speeds the fuel economy should improve by about 8.8%, half of this amount. The XA fuel economy at highway speeds should be that of the XB, 14.0 km per liter, times 1.088, which is an 8.8% improvement, this gives us 15.2 kilometers per liter. We compare that to the actual value of 15.7 kilometers per liter. So our quick estimate that aerodynamic drag accounts for about half of the total power requirement is quite good. Now I'll do a quick example problem. Here's a car with a given weight or mass, a given drag area, rolling resistance coefficient, and speed V. This is an error, of course. By the way, these numbers are based on a Honda Prelude that my son Luke used to drive. We want to estimate the power requirement of the engine in kilowatts delivered to the wheels. This is the equation for total power that I had written before. So we plug in the numbers, rolling resistance coefficient, weight, which is mg, times v, plus one half rho, v cubed, times drag area. We need some unity conversion factors, newton second squared per kilogram meter, and kilowatt second per 1,000 newton meter. We get 17.5 kilowatts. In English units, this is only 23.5 horsepower. As I mentioned previously, the actual power delivered by the engine must be greater than this due to inefficiencies and losses in the transmission and axle, etc. Also note that this is at steady speed. When you accelerate after a stoplight, the power delivered to the wheels will be much greater than this value during the acceleration. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.